Jose, can we? Yeah. Yeah. So hello everyone and welcome uh, again to the Colloquium, uh, Computational Science Research Center Colloquium and the program. Um, uh, I'm Carlos Paternina. I'm an assistant professor at the Management Information Systems Department uh, and a member of the center and uh, part of the faculty roster for the PhD program as well. Um, I have the honor to introduce a new faculty from our department, uh, uh, Yi Shu. Uh, he, uh, his PhD is from Nebraska Lincoln, I believe, and his work is in cybersecurity using uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques. I am going to let him do his own introduction. He has a slide for that, so I'm not going to mess with that. Uh, maybe <laughs> I, I say something incorrect. I don't want to. Uh, uh, so, that's all good. <laughs> so, so yeah, but uh, we've been developing a lot of uh, uh, joint work uh, recently into how we can apply those uh, techniques uh, into my area of work, which is supply chain analytics. Um, so for those of you that are looking for classes next semester, I do teach uh, supply chain analytics next semester. So just, uh, if you want to... Uh, understand how you, how you use data science uh, and optimization, large scale optimization to solve uh, problems in business. All right. So, Cindy, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you so much, Carlos. And uh, actually, Carlos is a great friend and also an amaz amazing colleague, too, in the MIS department. So, my name is uh, Shenji Xu. I'm currently, this is my first year, actually, first semester teaching and working at SDSU. And uh, I'd like to Thank Dr. Kasliel for this opportunity to meet with all of you. Uh, so the title of my talk today is called Cybersecurity in Intelligent Networking System. Uh, and uh, before I do begin, before I begin my talk today, I'd like to briefly introduce myself. Uh, I uh, this again, this is my first semester here, but before I was a assistant professor of computer and the cyber sciences at Dakota State University for three years. Uh, and as you can see from my educational background, of my all my degrees are actually from the computer science or com slash computer engineering side. And now I'm kind of defected to the uh, College of Business. <laughs> so, uh, so I did my PhD in computer engineering, uh, working, on research of, uh, working on research in cybersecurity and AI and machine learning from Nebraska Lincoln. Uh, and then before that, I did my master's degree in telecommunication, also working on cybersecurity from University of Pittsburgh. And before that, I had a CS uh, bachelor's degree. Uh, so I was I worked on I've been working on cybersecurity, robust AI, machine learning, and also secure edge computing, uh, as well as critical infrastructure protection. Uh, professionally, I'm I'm serving as a technical editor for the IEEE Wireless Communication, and as well as International Journal of Sensor Networks. Um, I'm also a TPC member for several international conferences, uh, um, and also have some industry certified uh, industry based certifications uh, like the. CNSS 4011 to 4015, which is certified by the U.S. Committee on National Security System, as well as some industry certifications from Cisco. Um, all right, so this is about myself, and I'd like to talk about the outline of today's talk. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, well, first of all, we're going to review two things. Uh, one is, the first thing is actually to provide the scope and the background of this research, and we're going to see some of the major cybersecurity problems and the cyber threats in communication networks, uh, for example, uh, some important intelligent networks such as uh, our 4G, 5G networks, and also some, uh, you know, vehicular networks and all that, uh, and also IoT networks as well, Internet of Things uh, networks. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to review what we can do better to defend that network against adversaries and cyber threats using AI and machine learning, and specifically using robust AI and machine learning. And finally, I'll discuss some of my future directions. Uh, so scope here, that's the first agenda. Um, so we're going to see some new cybersecurity news headlines first. And they're all from, they're all about uh, the serious cybersecurity incidents happened in the past two years. Uh, perhaps one of the biggest security incidents happened last year is was the uh, ransom attack uh, targeted on the Colonial Pipeline on the East Coast. Um, I had some family members, I still have some family members uh, living on the east coast and I, I remember they told me about the uh, gas price and also the shortage of gas at the time so that cyber attack uh, severely disrupted uh, the normal operation of you know the pipeline system which is one of the intelligent networking system because you need to have communications but sometimes you need to have optimizations involved in those pipeline systems so that caused huge economic loss in millions of dollars uh, another malicious attack called a distributed denial of service attack, uh, short for DDoS, right here. 
um, is known as one of the most vicious cyber attacks. Uh, so this forms flooding attacks from network traffic uh, packages generated from innocent machines, like your regular IoT devices at home, maybe a smart washing machine or maybe a smart speaker. They can be maliciously compromised by attacker and then they can utilize those machines to flood certain un uh, unnecessary packages to a particular server, then causing that server down and unable to respond to legitimate requests. Uh, so that's a very serious issue. Um, so that's those are all you know several uh, serious cyber attacks happening in the past two years. Of course, we have some others like the Facebook outage, or uh, networking outage, and also the SolarWinds hacker actually in SolarWinds breach stolen data. So there are serious issues. So. <clears throat> The scope, uh, the presentation scope and problem here. The fundamental question I'd like to mention here is that, well, first of all, all of these nuisances are not, were not happened exclusively in the past two years. Uh, in the security field or in the cybersecurity field, uh, the rivalry between attackers and uh, defenders has been going on for many decades and it will continue to um, be, that, be that way. So security researchers are asking themselves a very fundamental question and that is how can we uh, securely and effectively defend intelligent networking systems against adversaries and malicious threats. Uh, so in order to address this question in a very comprehensive manner, we need to take a look at some specific questions. Uh, first of all, we need to think about how to build and design a secure and a robust networking system. And if you consider that from a graph theory perspective, we're talking about nodes here, our specific endpoints. Uh, secondly, we need to work on how to design and sustain reliable communication networks. So again, from a graph theory perspective, that would be the links. And third, uh, we need to make sure that data processing and learning are trustworthy, so that predictive analytics carried out at the edge network or our, our communication networks are ethical and lawful. So that involves with AI and machine learning here. So with that being said, uh, here I represent, I, I present to you uh, my research journey, which is, you know, about cybersecurity uh, in the net, intelligent networking system right here. Uh, so I'm putting all my previous uh, research pieces together. Uh, so we're going to take a look at this definition here, here intelligent networking system. Um, uh, again, there are a lot of cyber threats uh, are happening in this uh, this type of network systems. Uh, and here we have three examples, and they are all selected from my papers. Um, the first one on the left side, we are seeing an example of a vehicle to everything network. Uh, we call it V2X uh, because we have communications going on from um, each party uh, or multiple parties. Uh, in this case, we have, uh, we're seeing communications everywhere from vehicle to pedestrian, uh, uh, short for V2P, uh, vehicle to network, short for V2N, uh, vehicle to infrastructure, V2I, and vehicle to vehicle, short for V2B. And this is extremely important for the future of vehicle communication, especially for self-driving vehicles. Um, and we are seeing the future of vehicle communication enabled by cellular networks, such as 4G and 5G. Oh, so this is one example. The second example is about the intelligent system in the smart power grid. Um, we're seeing edge networks in smart power grid. At the user end, the metering data is generated at the meter, smart meter side, and then uh, the data is being transmitted to uh, a, a concentrator uh, serving as a gateway uh, through multiple data aggregation points. The third example is really about uh, on the bottom right corner is about the intelligent system in the cellular communication. Uh, for 4G, 5G, and also beyond. Um, so these examples we can see our interconnected networks are facing a variety of cyber threats from traditional ones and also emerging ones. So here are the threat landscape, uh, and we're going to see the vulnerabilities and also the attack vectors here. Uh, again, we saw, we just mentioned about the denial of service attack um, that can bring a server down, making that server unable to respond to some leg legitimate request. Uh, we also see, we are seeing some other type of threats, for example, the zero-day zero explore, uh, malware, uh, for example, the ransomware attack or computer virus, as well as some failures and malfunctions. Uh, so, of course, uh, on the right side, I'm attaching a figure from the Anisha uh, called, uh, it's called European Union Agency for Cybersecurity. Uh, here it introduces uh, more abnormal behaviors, uh, such as physical attack. Uh, physical attack here means that uh, attackers can actually tear, tear down a base station power or maybe can bring down a certain building or a secure lab. 
And also we have some other attacks like a natural disasters that can also be quantified or categorized as one type of attack, um, now malfunctions and that. So with the, so many threats, we're wondering what type of security mechanism can be used to defend against those attacks. And specifically here, this research, we are interested in learning how data-driven methods like statistics or machine learning methods can be utilized to defend against those uh, attacks. So these days, cloud computing has been quite popular to offer security solutions. Uh, in this example, cloud computing has been applied to provide customized and also optimized uh, security services against the, the DDoS attack, the distributed denial of service attack. And you see the process here, routing, detection, response, and adapt. Especially the adapt here, they use ML to adapt to the attack pattern. And they have successfully prevented a DDoS attack uh, despite the attack, the throughput or the band, uh, throughput of that attack is 2.4 terabytes per second, uh, ter terabits per second. So that's actually 2.4 terabits coming to a server within one second. Uh, that's a lot of traffic. Uh, so certainly there's no way the server can respond to that kind of a request. And not to mention this is a very illegal uh, request. Now we have cloud computing, but the recent direction is that when we are dealing with edge networks, how, what are the solutions or what are the security countermeasures here? Well, security incidents occur at the edge network and also uh, our inter intelligent networking system. So it's time to move our network parameter to the edge. Uh, so the idea is that we need to have a commanding node to serve as a gateway so that it can perform many services and tasks, not just computational tasks, communication tasks, and also provide storage capabilities, but also this commanding node, this gateway should be able to defend a certain edge network or multiple edge networks. Uh, and we have many benefits for having a edge uh, commanding node like that because it provides low latency and it, with multiple edge nodes, it can perform, it can form a swarm intelligence. So we do need that. And certainly if we see many smart city applications like self-driving vehicles, 5G, uh, and device-to-device -device communications, even telecommunication, tele telehealth, and other IoT cases, we need to have a faster and more efficient uh, predictive analytics. And that's how edge computing can play the job uh, and do the job. And so then we're going to rely on this edge node um, to perform many security solutions as well. For example, they can be used to perform intrusion detection, access control, and authentication. Uh, so that I'd like to briefly talk about the concept of edge computing. And this is actually a concept originally published by Cisco in 2014. So not, not that long ago. Uh, it's originally published in an IEEE conference paper. Uh, and here we have another definition. It's called edge computing is a networking philosophy focused on bringing computing as close to the source of the data as possible in order to reduce latency and bandwidth. Now that's a big difference. When we use cloud computing, we have to rely on that service from a remote place. In this case, Google has its own cloud computing platform. Amazon also has its own cloud computing platform, but they're in a different place. They're in, in a different state. Um, but with edge computing, we can actually use that for lo local. Uh, we can actually utilize that for local use. So for example, for self-driving vehicle, maybe some of you have Tesla and you use that for self-driving, but you actually rely on the centralized the computer there. But in some cases, you want to make sure that, hey, maybe, you know, when I go through a traffic light, the traffic light can actually serve as an edge computing node. And that traffic light can do way more things than just showing us the red, yellow, and green lights. Maybe the traffic light and also with the computational cap uh, components there in the traffic light, maybe it can help me, my car, for better lane detection to avoid potential traffic accidents because it's an edge way. It reduces the latency, it provides low latency, and also with multiple traffic lights, with multiple edge nodes, it can perform a swarm intelligence. So that brings to me to the next point. Maybe we can also in, uh, uh, invite edge computing for security services. And see from this pic uh, picture right here, you see the comparison. Before we have cloud computing, or uh, today we have cloud computing, tomorrow we're going to have edge computing, which we are distributing the intelligent core or the modules to each individual area or in each individual uh, cases. So the goal here, the objective here is to get ahead of attack with ever improving threat intelligence with the help of AI and machine learning and also statistics. And of course, we need to collect the data first. Then inspect the network traffic with our performance trade-off 
uh, maintain visibility from a single control plane. Cloud computing, we have yeah. So cloud computing or the cloud AI, basically we're talking about is centralized the computing server or computing cluster. And you have to get services from this big cluster in a centralized place. Uh, so that's why we have a big green brain here and it's distributing or offloading services uh, well not offloading, uh, distributing its services to each end user right here but with edge computing basically we want to make sure the location of that decision making process stays as close to you as possible yeah, i got that but what is the role, the role of the cloud ai now? the role of the cloud ai the role of the cloud AI, basically there are still many uh, centralized tasks that needs to be addressed by cloud AI. Uh, but the goal here is that we have many tasks that should not be requested to centralize the cloud. We should get it down as early as possible and as close as possible. So that's why people want to have edge comp computing or edge AI. But the ultimate goal is to basically use the cloud AI to uh, basically, I think the goal is not to rely on edge cloud AI at all. We should actually just rely on the edge AI um, because edge AI should have the uh, most of the capabilities that cloud AI has. Uh, but at the same time, uh, with multiple edge AI, they can work together because they're seeing different data here. But when they work together, they can have a better learning model. And with much faster response, it will be much better. Uh, so that's the general idea. Uh, uh, so certainly we want to use that for cybersecurity. Uh, but one thing I want to mention here is that it seems great and it seems like we can use AI and machine learning to do many great things. But as technology has proven to us, it's always a double-edged sword. Uh, so one of the papers I read uh, is the title is actually, it's actually a very interesting paper and it's uh, from a IEEE magazine paper. And the title of this paper is called AI for Beyond 5G Networks, semicolon a cybersecurity defense or offense enabler. So we want to make sure we are using that for defense uh, purposes, but then little, little did we know that AI and machine learning can also be maliciously utilized by attackers to, prevent, uh, to, to perform some offensive uh, actions or operations. Uh, so in this figure, we're seeing multiple parties um, and they are victims. They're defenders and they're offenders. Uh, so here I use red color to highlight three parts. Um, they're called in token anomaly intrusion detection, poisoning attacks, and also invasion attacks. So I'm going to talk about those three in my talk. And uh, I also use green color here to highlight two other key points. Uh, they are called zero, zero day vulnerability detection and also next generation malware. So certainly you see attackers, they're actually using AI and machine learning to generate uh, next generation malware samples to harm the uh, uh, na the nation's critical infrastructure. Uh, so, all right. So, I'd like to review a quick. I'd like to quickly review a very general machine learning and uh, AI and machine learning development process. Um, this is probably you, this picture. You have probably seen this picture a lot uh, from your machine learning or AI courses or your data science courses. Uh, in the beginning, we need to deal with, prepare with training data. And also we also have to uh, get some pre-processed data so that we can apply code to perform training. And certainly when it comes to the model building, we're gonna select, uh, we're gonna compare uh, multiple machine learning models. And then after the training, we have to perform validation, cross-validation, capable cross-validation to select the best model. And once we select the best model, we will gonna use that for testing and also for deployment. And certainly, you know, for different phases, you're gonna see different roles of engineers doing the job, especially when we want to get labeled the data or clean the data, we are seeing data engineers do the job. And when we are building the model, training the model, we have data scientists. And later on, when we try to deploy the model, we have machine learning engineers and developers to do machine learning DevOps. Uh, so, so this is a general process. Now let's take a look at you know, the second point here, which is how can we address cybersecurity in the intelligent networking system? And I'm going to talk about this from three different perspective, uh, perspectives. The first one is how can we perform secure intrusion detection? Um, because you have, we have cyber intrusions and it's really an important task to detect those cyber intrusions. But how can we do that in a very secure way? 
Uh, the second one is how to how can we build robust AI and machine learning models so that those models cannot will not be fooled by some specifically designed samples. So you might think, hey, you probably have built some machine learning models in your homework assignments, but are they really robust? Are they really trustworthy? Are you confident to deploy them for production or deployment? So that's a, a different task. And certainly there are many training data. Or there are different data samples that can actually uh, deceive the machine learning model you train. So that's a big problem. And we want to make sure that when we have edge computing ready one day, the edge computing itself will not be fooled by attackers or will not be fooled by those malicious data samples. And lastly, it's about reliability and resiliency. Um, so the first one is about secure intrusion detection. Um, so we do have some existing intrusion detection products and solutions. Uh, but the problem with this, uh, the limitation of this is that they produce high missed alarms and the false alarm rates. So in machine learning, that would be type one error, right? Um, so it comes to detect actual intrusions only afterwards. That's also a very common thing. Like intrusion already occurred and then you detect them after the attack. So we don't want to see that, but those are some of the limitations of intrusion detection systems. And the, to perform intrusion detection, it's extremely challenging because we have some noisy packets. We have some bad packets. We have some out of date packets data. Uh, and also, if you look at the traffic sample, we have too few attacks per million sessions. We have, most of them are normal uh, traffic samples, but still we want to detect those attacks. And I'm sure, you know, although you can use zero shot learning or few shot learning, but in traditional machine learning, you have to have a bunch of data. Uh, at least your labeling, your, your sem the, the ratio of your labels, label data should be at least either evenly distributed or what. Um, another hard part to perform intrusion detection is that, uh, some of the network traffics, they are encrypted. So meaning they are in unrecognizable characters. So there's no way you can perform machine learning on un unrecognizable data. It's very hard. Uh, there are some ways, but not common ways. Um, also how to conduct intrusion detection, both locally and globally, that's a big part. And also there's a need for a large and consistent changing library for attack signatures, because many companies and organizations, they only only, they only purchase intrusion detection systems because there will be an auditing process and they don't only buy it uh, because, you know, to satisfy that requirement, they don't really update them. But the goal here is that you want to update your machine learning model. So that's another challenging part. So we did some work and we start to generate our own data set using a software called Zeek, uh, which is an open source network security monitoring tool. And the goal here is that we want to have some synthetic data generation. Uh, this is our initial work uh, with, and we generate some normal traffic data, but also we generate some uh, suspicious attack data, but in an isolated network environment. Uh, so uh, we have, we use Zeek and also the Zeek logs files, they contain common and inbound and outbound network traffic protocols. And the data format is either in JSON or CSV file from a one unit commodity hardware. Uh, and also we initially we evaluate that by applying unsupervised learning model. Uh, it looks great, but then we realize something, uh, there's something missing. And this is because we read a paper, we read a paper. Uh, the paper is called the do's and the don'ts of machine learning in computer security. And it was published uh, two, years, two years ago. Uh, if you look at this machine learning workflow here, uh, in the beginning, we have to define a problem. In this case, we need to define what problem were we trying to address here? In this case, we want to perform intrusion detection. So in this case, the security problem is to identify those novel attacks. And eventually we will have a solution, which is to come up with a learning-based intrusion detection system. Uh, so we will have a intrusion detection system, but it's enabled by machine learning and AI. Uh, but if you look at the machine learning workflow right here, this is the general process of when you do your machine learning task. We have to go through data collection process and the labeling. We have to go through system design learning, meaning we have to train a model. We also have to go through performance evaluation because we have to evaluate our model. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, so for the sampling uh, of uh, we're labeling the data, that seems like a retroactive process. Like if you're doing like dump check and some sort of security, right? Like you're really looking what happened. Or, or is there another way to do it? So so basically we want to so there are two ways we can do that. One is based on historical data, like this previously, you know, data that contains cyber attacks, or you want to generate some synthetic data, which is something we did earlier. So there's only 
this is the, I would say this is the first step to build some model. Otherwise, and with that model, then you, uh, the second step is actually to perform real-time intrusion detection. Does that answer your question? Okay, yeah, so, so, and then that's the third step, performance evaluation. And then eventually, once you have a mature and optimized model, you want to deploy it uh, and the, for, for operation. But the, this paper actually talked about the uh, 10 common pitfalls. Uh, they start from P1 to P10. And I want to highlight two pitfalls here. One is data collection and training, P2. Uh, they talk about ground truth labels required for classification tasks are inaccurate and also unstable. Sometimes you have missing labels as well. Uh, and also, especially for network traffic and traffic data, because we're not looking at a toy or dummy data right here. We're talking, looking at a data set from a specific application intuition detection. Sometimes your traffic data, you might have some labeled traffic data saying, hey, this is a DDoS attack data, but most of the traffic data is unlabeled. Okay, and we'll talk about why, when you have a setting like that, how can we address this issue? Uh, another pitfall is called P10, uh, inappropriate threat model, meaning that the security of your machine learning model is not considered. Uh, and that exposes the system to a variety of attacks, such as poisoning and invasion attack. So this might be new to most of you because we might think, hey, once we build a model, we don't have to worry about the security of a machine learning model, but then we will see why machine learning models are so vulnerable to attacks. All right, so, so here is the general approach to perform uh, intrusion detection. And I took this from a paper and uh, you might think, hey, this is a really perfect way to perform intrusion detection using machine learning. And this is a, your standard machine learning process. You have a raw data set from a database you pre-process it and you, you select several machines uh, and then you perform some feature engineering, feature selection, feature engineering and all that. And then you try different machine learning models, uh, RF, random forest, SVM, support vector machine, and then an artificial neural network. You try some different models and then you try cross validation you, and you want to select the best model. And then eventually you will have your labels here. So different classes. So in, in this case, it's a multi-label classification problem. You think that's a perfect answer a perfect solution for this. But here, the problem is this type of traditional, traditional approaches formalize this problem as a supervised problem or a unsupervised learning problem. So what is the cases when you can conf confidently apply supervised learning? Well, the cases are when you have fully labeled data, right? And what are the cases you can apply unsupervised learning models? The cases are your data set doesn't have any labels. But when you have a data set with some labeled data, or let's say a small portion of your data samples are labeled, the majority of the data set samples are not labeled. How can you do that? And especially in cybersecurity cases, when you look at the network traffic set, or traffic data set, a small portion of the amount of the traffic samples are labeled, meaning attacks. So you have DOS attack, denial of service attack. You also have uh, many other different types of attack like backdoor attack, analysis attack, reconnaissance attack. So you're actually interested to learn those things, but there are small portion in your traffic data set. The majority of your traffic data samples are unlabeled. And the, another thing about those unlabeled traffic samples is that are, are all those unlabeled traffic samples normal traffic samples? Not really, because they can still contain some attacks, but you just we just don't know that. So this is a challenging part. How can we address this issue? So this is what we did. And also certainly we find some other papers that share the similar concern. Um, um, so this is what we did actually. At the first stage, we trying to uh, we trying to manipulate both the observed network intuitions and also some unlabeled samples. So we will have some labeled data and there are cyber intuitions and they are observed already. But also we have some unlabeled samples. Uh, with those all observed network intrusions, they are definitely different from uh, each other. So we have some DOS attacks. So for example, we have analysis type of attack. We have exploit type of uh, cyber intrusions. We have backdoor, we have denial of service attack. So if you look at the pattern, they are different. Meaning <coughs> observed network intrusions are different from each other and they should not be simply classified as one concept center, meaning we're not performing a binary classification, either zero or one, good and bad. We need to take this out, each different types of cyber attacks separately. So this is the first step or the first stage. We want to make sure that observed network intrusions are different from each other. 
Uh, and then since the network intrusions are really diverse, uh, diversified, in this case, we have different types and we have more actually. Uh, we're trying to separate them into different clusters so that the samples of each cluster are similar to each other. Uh, and this is one way that we can accurately pinpoint a specific type of attack. Um, the second stage is that, so this is really about the, the labeled data, uh, meaning the observed network intrusions. But for the large amount of unlabeled samples, for about them, what should we do? Well, we aim to filter both the potential network intrusions and also the reliable normal samples. So what do we mean by that? For those unlabeled data, again, there are some of them are, oh, I would say, oh, I shouldn't say this, but some of them are normal traffic samples. Some of them are still attack samples, but we just don't know that. So we want to filter these two. Uh, so in this case, the potential network intrusions and also reliable normal samples from them, we want to filter both these two from them with the consideration of something called isolation score and also their similarity level uh, to the observed anomalies. So we're going to use the observed anomaly that we did in the first stage to, uh, to filter the potential network intrusion and also the reliable normal samples. And the intuition of this is that on one hand, the potential network intrusion should be different from normal samples because they're intrusions. But, and this, they can be easily isolated. But the other hand, on the other hand, um, they should be similar to some of the observed anomalies, meaning those potential network intrusions, although we're not that confident to call them anomalies already, but they should be at least closer to the observed anomalies. So goal here is to build a weighted multi-class label to distinguish different anomalies from the normal samples. Um, so we did something and I really, and we also tried to evaluate that. Uh, we, we managed to evaluate the performance on several data sets. Uh, we tried to benchmark the data sets and, and as well as we tried that on our synthetic traffic data sets. Uh, so we have some results. Uh, and certainly we, the goal here is that eventually we're gonna move to real-time intrusion detection because there's no way you can uh, build a machine learning model and then detect attack maybe one month after that. So that's the goal. Uh, but in order to perform real-time intrusion detection, or in your case, real-time machine learning, you have to apply many other techniques like online learning, incremental learning, and all that. Uh, so the goal we did, we actually built our own test bed. Now we didn't, well, not only we try that on some benchmark data set, but also we are building our own test bed to see that with Raspberry Pis and with uh, NVIDIA JSON Nano, which is a small computer. Um, so we did some work in that. Um, and my goal here is to talk about some high-level research topics. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, and the, here are some related uh, uh, papers that we worked on here, uh, some of the publications. Uh, so this is one goal here. Uh, one type of work we, wanted, we did is secure intrusion detection. The second project we're working on is how can we build uh, robust AI, edge AI, or robust AI, um, AI machine learning against the poisoning attack and adversarial attack. And how can we build that to extend that to the edge computing? So uh, we talk uh, we talk about the security of machine learning model, and I said it's like maybe it might be a new concept to most of you, uh, but this is the what I mean here. When we build our machine learning model, especially when you get your data curation, model training, model validation, model deployment, and also eventually when you monitor the model, there are so many places that attackers can take advantage of each operation. And when I say take advantage of find, um, in cybersecurity term, we call this attack vectors, meaning we want to find a venue or a path to compromise your system. So in this case, there are cur data curation, meaning you are collecting the data. Uh, when you collect the data, there are high chance that attackers can actually poison your, your data sample. So we have poisoning here. So let's say you have a training data set let's say 20% of them are poisoned already. And then you use that data set to train a machine learning model. Would you be confident to use that model? No, because it's compromised. Also, there are also many other ways to uh, compromise your machine learning model. So, you know, everybody has, everyone has its own, uh, his or her own cell phone. And uh, there are many uh, predictive analytics operations carried on your cell phone. When your cell phone is compromised by the attacker, they can easily change your machine learning models. And th these machine learning models are basically mathematical vectors, right? You do the some machine learning models before. So this is one way to perform model poisoning attack. And the, the, before the poisoning one, we call it data poisoning attack. And that happens during the training phase. Both of these happened 
uh, uh, happen in, uh, in the training phase. Uh, so once you have the model built, we can still deceive or full and fool your machine learning model. Uh, and we're going to see some here. Uh, I'm going to show you a picture here uh, just to get you into, uh, interested. So let's say you have a machine learning model built already. Uh, and you are very confident to deploy this model to a particular service. Now, let's say you build an image, image recognition model for image recognition system. Let's say you build a deep learning model to identify the label of certain image pieces, okay? So here, if you're a human, we all know that's a panda, okay? And when you build a machine learning model, you will say, hey, I'm 57.7 confident that this picture is a panda. And this is what your machine learning model will say. Now, the attackers can actually add something it uh, looks like a noise sample, but uh, technically we call it a perturbation. Attackers can add this perturbation onto this original image, and then you will have a new image generated. Now, in this new image, to human, it still looks like a panda, correct? But if you input this image to your trained machine learning model, it will say, hey, this is a given, which is a type of my monkey. And then the machine learning model will say, hey, I'm 99% confident that this is a given. Oh, this is a monkey instead of a panda. Although to human, it looks still looks like a panda. So this is a perfect example, just showing you that the security of your machine learning model is compromised, and the attacker actually just create a noise sample to kind of fool or the, and deceive the machine learning model we just trained. Uh, one thing I want to make sure is that this perturbation, this noise, is not randomly generated. It's mathematically calculated. So just like when you train machine learning model, basically it's an optimization problem. Your machine learning, basically you want to find the best model weights or parameters in this, and you have a fixed uh, training set. Basically your training set is a fixed data value. In this case, it's the, it's the, it's the opposite way. Your model is fixed, but the attacker is trying to adjust how large can this perturbation go so that we can give you the wrong prediction results? So it's a mathematical model. Um, it's a mathematical, it's an optimization problem, but it's not that difficult. So we see some other examples here. Originally, we have an elephant bush, uh, African uh, bush elephant with the amplified perturbation, now it's the goldfish. But to human, these are these two are still elephants, right? Uh, a very serious, a very dangerous application would be can be applied on self-driving vehicles. We have a stop sign. Then with this perturbation, you have a speed limit sign, which could be 80 miles per hour. So you should hit brake, but then it accelerates. So that could cause several damages, right? So, and certainly in real world application, we have sticker attack, meaning they come, they actually put the stickers on self sign and then uh, compromise and cause some many traffic accidents. Um, and so then we, you can try build some by yourself. In this case, we are building a small record machine model using the radical based uh, function. This is one of the kernel functions you want to choose. When you increase the perturbation, the, this, the, the your prediction accuracy goes dramatically from 100% to lower than 40%. Um, so, so this is one way to compromise the machine learning model during the testing phase, but before these two are happening during the training phase. All right, so how do we do that? Well, you get the idea. Basically, the poisoning attack, they, happen, they, they can compromise the training data. So we want to make sure when we collect the data, when we collect the training data, the sample should be at least intact and clean. And they should be sanitized. Um, learning process, uh, local model poisoning attack, they can compromise your machine learning model. So if you're training a machine learning model using uh, scikit-learn or using our language uh, and when your machine learning model, your computer is compromised, then there's a chance attackers can change your machine learning model. And then eventually for the, when you have the model built deployed, people can perform every server attack to kind of compromise, to fool your training model. Uh, so this is very serious. And here, everything we're talking about here is for a single machine learning model, okay? I hope you still remember about Edge AI, which is about distributed AI model. So imagine, a bunch of AI models are compromised. And that's going to be, and the scale of the, the disaster zone is actually increasing here. So, so one of the work we are working on is how to defend against data poisoning attack. And many people are also working on this field. Uh, and certainly this is one of our ongoing work. Uh, we're trying to use bagging, the bootstrap aggregation, aggregation aggregating um, to, to address this issue. But the key part, part, or, part or the challenging part in this research is how can we build that in a distributed way, not just on a single machine. 
And another key part is depends on the portion of the poison the samples. Now, before I say, when your training data is when your training data con contains one percent of the poison sample, maybe that doesn't affect your overall performance. But when your training data is, com is has let's say sixty percent of the compromised the samples, so, so it's over half. So it's going to be very hard for you to build, build a healthy uh, model. Um, but you, really, you don't really know that, right? So it's a, it's a challenging part. Uh, uh, so we, we're also trying to do some research in this area, uh, aerosol machine learning, meaning we're actually trying to see uh, how to make sure the machine learning model that people train are still robust. Even attackers will always do this type of uh, visual things, how can we still make sure the machine learning model we train are, are robust? And uh, before we say, hey, this is an image recognition system, but the domain can be extended to other domains. Um, this is for image, but it can extend to audio, to video, to software, to traffic. In, and in our case, we want to make sure we have some antivirus software pieces. And we show most of them have installed antivirus software on our own machine. But many of them are enabled by AI. So we want to make sure when there's a malware or when there's a computer virus coming to your computer, and it's, it's also, uh, or maybe there's a benign software, but it's some malicious software in disguise. Can we still detect them? So we're trying to work on something called a uh, uh, adversarial byte replacement. This is one uh, study we did. We're actually trying to be the attacker here for a second. We want to make sure we can add some minor payload to a software piece that cannot be detected by the antivirus software pieces. Uh, so this is one job we did. We, may, we are making some fine grain changes to specific bytes. Uh, so we actually injected some adversarial payload here without breaking the file com uh, functionality. Um, and we use a machine or deep learning model called MALCAL. Uh, it stands for Malicious Convolution Neural Network. And it looks like this. The architecture looks like this. Uh, we're trying to see if our designed software sample can invade the malware detection by this malicious, uh, by this MALCAL uh, uh, malware convolution neural network. Uh, so we actually did. Uh, so this is one student's work. Actually, actually this is uh, one of the PhD student's uh, work, and he did, he completed about the dissertation at my previous university. Uh, so this is, and he's performing, uh, uh, he's acting as an attacker. Uh, we're also trying to, well, of course, we have to be uh, the defender here. So we actually did another job just to see if we can evaluate the robustness of your machine learning model. So this is an interesting point. Uh, when we talk about cybersecurity, we always think about, hey, there should be a metric or there should be a score to assess how good or how robust or how secure a computing system is. For example, we might have a score just to evaluate how secure this laptop is. So let's say 90 out of 100. That, that's, a, that's the score of the security or the robustness of this mach computing machine. But we should also have the same thing for machine learning models. One out of five, or maybe four out of five, depends on your choice. But how to build that tracking scoring system is hard. So this is a job by, done by a second PhD student, and that's his uh, doctor dissertation right here. Uh, so his job is actually just to see with different machine learning models, can we identify and figure out some benchmark testing system to see uh, whether we can assess that machine learning model. Uh, so those are some of the projects we did before. Um, but eventually, ultimately, the goal is to see that in the edge AI. And not only we want to, we want machine learning and AI to be deployed in the edge compu computing uh, environment, but also want to make sure they are immune to data poisoning attack, model poisoning attack, and also adversarial attack. So this is the ultimate goal here. Um, the third project we did is has nothing to do with AI and machine learning per se, but uh, uh, this is some of our previous work when I was a doctoral student, uh, and this is funded by my advisors, uh, NSF projects. Uh, we're trying to make sure that in order to have a secure network environment, not only we want to make sure the nodes are secure, the flows are secure, but also the links should be robust, uh, reliable as well. Uh, so we did some resiliency study on communication and the computing system, as well as to analyze the survivability of communication uh, networks. So this has a lot similarities with you know what just happened with the uh, pandemic uh, because uh, when you look at the virus spread uh, phenomenon it has a lot to do with network science and graph theory um, and it, it kind of 
can help us to understand better on how network why networks are robust uh, to failures and the, and the, why they are they fra fragile to attacks. Uh, so this is another work we did. Um, so one of the ongoing projects I'm working on right now with my student is the security in the software supply chain. This is very interesting. Now we have a most of us have a basic understanding of what a supply chain is, but what is a software supply, uh, supply chain? Well, um, I'm sure many of you have built a machine learning model or even a deep learning model before, but in order to build a deep learning model, it will take many resources, your time, your computational resources, and also not to mention you have to get tons of uh, training data to do that. Uh, so most, most of the people just don't build a deep learning model from scratch. They download one from a certain website. So they, down, they would download a pre-trained deep learning model and then use that for your own tasks or your, your, your own missions. In this case, there are people contributing models. So they have, you have the model owners and then certainly you have the brokers and then with, um, I say a platform right here. And then you, you as the end user can download some pre-trained models from the brokers or from some online websites and then use it for your own. In this case, we have a website called modelzoo.com uh, uh, which, offers a variety of deep learning models. In this case, you see our you know, convolution neural networks and also some other uh, deep learning models. But the problem with this type of thing, uh, just like supply chain, you have the suppliers, you have intermediary uh, of, of entities, and then eventually you have customers. Just like that model, we are seeing a, some issues here. Neutral trojans, uh, trojan, which is a type of computer virus, are embedded in pre-trained neural networks. And they are a very harmful attack against machine learning and deep learning model supply chain. Uh, and I'm sure uh, that we cannot use all the, we cannot build all the models by ourselves. Even in real economy, people have to exchange commodities and you have, that's why we have input and outputs. But in this case, when it comes to the cyberspace, we also have to rely on some models built by people from other nations or other regions. So in this case, you know, when that happens, we have to, we have to examine the models they build. But they but if we don't do that kind of auditing or assessment, then they're immune to they find them way to poison your attack. So attackers can create a very powerful and secret backdoor trojan, which is a type of computer virus, by injecting a few neurons and lines of code. And the key word here is just a few few lines of code. <clears throat> and certainly we see a, a, a research paper talking about this. So New, uh, neural trojans actually allows attackers to precisely control a neural network's behavior. So actually you're downloading a neural network, but actually uh, the attacker is commanding this neural network. Uh, so this is ongoing research, and the, I have some similar research working on this. For example, we are using reinforcement learning to see how we can use, how, how, how to use that for penetration testing, which is a cybersecurity mission here. Uh, but this is a very key, uh, important uh, task, and certainly I would uh, like to work on this more. So you might think, hey, you know, security of machine learning maybe is still in its infant phase. Not really. This is, these are the uh, headlines for every zero machine learning. Uh, so it's a great thing that people are working on machine learning and AI on data science, but uh, similar, uh, uh, also equally important is we should put a great emphasis on the adversarial machine learning. Um, so we see some of that uh, highlights here. Uh, there's GPT-2, knows your phone number. Especially, I think most of us are overwhelmed to see the chat G GPT these days uh, and how amazing they can do. Uh, I saw a news yesterday. Uh, many people ask chat P uh, GPT to write novels or answer some questions, but some people are asking that to write a code. Yeah. And what's more interesting is that they, their users posting a code as an input and ask a chat uh, PGP, uh, P, a GPT to say, hey, what's wrong with my code? Actually, the AI actually tells you, hey, I'm debugging this for you, line seven, blah, blah, blah. This is extremely scary to me personally. Um, but uh, I, like I said, we sometimes we use AI for defense, but you know, AI can be used for offense missions, but in this case, that type of service can actually, you know, could be dangerous uh, in some cases. So that's uh, one of the examples here. So when it comes to cybersecurity and AI, and uh, I hope what I'm saying here uh, brings you a direction uh, in the intersection between security and AI. 
is that when we're developing machine learning models, we have some several problems to pay attention to. And when we're dealing with, when we are, uh, and here are the gaps in machine learning development at this stage. Um, and it certainly when you build your model and when the model is complete, we also have some gaps, especially right here, gaps where machine learning system is under attack. Uh, how can we address that issue? Um, so that's the end of my second point here. Um, I like to quickly talk about my future work. Um, and um, this is one of the uh, National Science Foundation uh, uh, solicitation call for proposal. They talk about it's short for RINGS, Resilient Intelligent Net uh, Next Generation System. Basically, you see the federal government is uh, actively searching research efforts in the intersection of these three, uh, cybersecurity, communication, networking, AI, machine learning, and big data. Uh, so that's a big area. And certainly you see many other federal level agencies like NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is a government branch under the US Department of Commerce. They are also issuing multiple white papers showing, uh, asking for help, uh, also asking for future efforts. In this case, we see 5G security um, and also supply chain assurance as well. And, uh, you know, Internet of Things, data security as well, uh, trusted cloud. Uh, so for me, personal direction is going to be, for me, the short term is well, I would like to explore more on how to build a secure and robust swarm intelligence for edge networks. Uh, for the long term or for the midterm, uh, of course, we want to make sure that we are, we are building attack resilient cyber physical system, as well as how to build, uh, establish secure data communications. Um, um, so I'd like to talk about some of my previous work. Uh, this is what I did in, uh, when I was with my last university. Uh, we did something very interesting. Uh, the first project is called Smart Power System. It, Smart stands for Secure Machine Learning and AI for Resilient Power System. And we actually, uh, part of this project is funded by the NSF NRT and also South Dakota Governor Research Center. Uh, and it's a collaboration with two different universities. One is uh, my last university, Dakota State University. The other one is South Dakota State University, also short for SDSU. Uh, so we actually build a center for that. We have national labs collaborators. We also have utility companies helping us. And we also have industry partners right here. So we're trying to build a, uh, to merge the uh, bridge between smart grid domain, you know, people from WE electrical engineering department and also computer science department as well. Um, the second project we worked on is how to build a cyber physical social system for understanding and throttling the enlist, enlisted economy. So we put a big emphasis on digital forensics. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with forensics, but when it comes to digital forensics, it's really about how to deal with cyber crimes. Uh, so one of my job is actually just to deal with machine learning and the data mining part. But many of our other uh, colleagues are working on ocean, open source intelligent, uh, intelligent threat uh, uh, framework. And uh, we also have other faculty members who have clearance to work with uh, law enforcement agents as well. Um, the th third project is really an educational project. It's really about a virtual institute for AI and machine learning and blockchain enabled modernization for education and research in cyber defense and the electromagnetic spectrum operations. And this is for actually for the, the ROTC, the uh, reserve officers for Oh, what does this stand for? Oh, it's actually for military officers, but we, it's an educational projects. Uh, so we also worked on that. Um, so lastly, it is actually my own doctoral research from 2015 to 2019. Um, and my advisor has these two NSS projects. So I worked on AI for robust machine learning, secure edge computing, um, privacy preserving machine learning, applied cryptography, and also how to work on net network reliability. Uh, my co-authors and also my lab mates, they worked on public safety communication, uh, cellular vehicle to vehicle, vehicle, to vehicle everything. Um, so because we have a large audience uh, from the students, so I'd like to talk about my courses uh, and uh, some of the student research projects. So I'm teaching two courses right now. Uh, one is uh, from our MIS department in the College of Business. Uh, one is called the Fundamentals of Cybersecurity Management. Uh, um, it's offered this semester and also next semester, and also another course is called Secure Enterprise Networking and Mobile Technology. Uh, and certainly we have a new course approved and ex it is expected to deliver it in the spring of 2024. Uh, it's called AI and Machine Learning for Cybersecurity and uh, Threat Intelligence. So that's a uh, inter very interesting course. Uh, we also have one, so currently myself, we have a, I have a one to two GA position available in the spring of 2023. And possibly we can, I think if we only have 
uh, I think we can hire uh, some more for this fall of 2023. Uh, it will be 10 hours per week or five hours. Uh, if you have background in AI, either AI, machine learning or cybersecurity, feel free to reach out to me. And that's my email address. Uh, that's, uh, uh, we can talk about some projects together. Um, uh, to conclude my talk, uh, a cybersecurity intelligent networking system, it's a, it's a big issue. Uh, and it's time to change our thinking and come up with new and innovative methods to assure the normal operations in the edge network. Uh, when we build the AI models and machine learning models, we want to make sure not only they can work, but also they, can they are secure. They are immune to all those new ways and new forms of attacks. Uh, so that's the end of my talk, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Yes. Um, so I noticed that you were uh, doing comparison from the home that we use like random forest or uh, you know neural networks. Um, and I was curious if there were any studies like even types of approach like all the different formers. Yeah, are you talking about this slide, by the way? So this is not my work. This is what traditional, or traditionally what other people would do. Mm -hmm. um, but I have not taken a look at your approach, but I think I'll, we can talk about that. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, so uh, do your like, analysis uh, with the different variables that you find important issues that were important? Uh, yes. Yes, definitely. Certainly, you know, what type of protocol, network traffic protocol you use is a big one. And also we need to examine the payload, the payload size, because sometimes, you know, if you're going to have a very tiny payload, then it probably won't make a difference. But when the size of the payload is large and when you carry such specific payloads, then it's going to be a major feature right there. Mm -hmm. um, but we actually, uh, so performing, like I said, uh, although they did, uh, this is a standard way to do uh, machine learning, but feature selection and feature engineering is still very important. And uh, certainly there are ways to identify what features should we pay attention to. Uh, so not only we need to address uh, what type of the label issue, uh, missing the label and all that, but also when it comes to, uh, you know, selecting features, that's also a key point. Are you, oh, you guys just hungry, <laughs> right? <Okay. laughs> so yes. It's, it's yeah. interesting enough. Um, well, one of the entrepreneurial activities that I did when I was in Colombia uh, back two years ago, mm -hmm. it was uh, uh, I developed a platform for uh, freight, and then I was selling the platform locally to several companies mm -hmm. in uh, the transportation industry. There were two were carriers, one was a port. Uh, one of the carriers um, got attacked, hmm. and I was not able to protect the data at that time. So I lost the customer. Um, this uh, is this for sure I did. Uh, but then uh, when I did the forensic problem uh, to analyze what happened, um, they actually built fake drivers profiles. Mm -hmm. And then with those drivers profiles, they were able to bid in the platform because it was a reverse option right. uh, type of stuff. So they were able to bid and they many times were winning the auction, but then nobody showed up uh, to pick up the car. Right. So uh, so uh, at the very end, we found out that uh, it was just malware. malware mm. Mm. And, and it, the, the barrier that we put there uh, was not able to protect. Right. Uh, the, the, the yeah, it's it's always a headache when because because it's really hard to realize well we actually you know, our computing system are, are already infected with malware and uh, so I think uh, one of the projects I did before is when so uh, so in this project uh, many of my, my colleagues they have clearance so they are allowed to work with uh, attorney offices attorney general offices in, in in the state of South Dakota. So in the AG office. So what they did actually is they're actually uh, using all the DMV certified the drugs license to make sure that you can you, you you can be authenticated once. You don't have to expose your other computing resources to the public. Because otherwise, once you expose your public resources, your computing devices to the public, then you open a door for the attacker. So what they did is actually very interesting. Um, 
when we go to the airport to get through the TSA, usually you, we used to uh, show two types of four form um, uh, documents. One is our driver's license or any approved ID. The other is actually your boarding pass. But now we only need to show our driver's license. Uh, one of the reasons is because of the research they did right there, because they want to make sure, hey, can we improve the algorithm so that users, in this case, custom, uh, uh, you know, uh, travelers don't have to show their phone and then go to a specific, uh, you know, airline app or maybe in this case the Apple Wallet to to launch those. Because because there are times, you know, when you show the QR code in an airport in an open unsecured Wi-Fi network, attackers actually can plant malicious scripts there. And every time you open Apple wallet or let's say United Airlines apps, the scripts will trigger because we are connected to an unsecure airport hotspot. So the goal for these people or for our pre for my previous team is that we just need, want you to show the physical driver's license. We don't want to show any digital device. Physical device is actually a lot easier to protect because you're just talking to the, uh, the officer there. But when you launch a digital device, it opens tons of do yeah. doors. So I, I would, I, I'm sorry to hear, yeah, I'm sorry to hear your case, but that's definitely, that's something we call attack surface in cybersecurity, meaning we are opening more doors to attackers. So the goal is to minimize the attack surface, but still get the job done. So, so I hope that's uh, something we can uh, discuss. Cool. Yeah, that's, that's, that should be thought. <laughs> Well, I'm not going to be able to get a job on the reference to the government. And there is a problem with the government. I can't be told you somewhere.